Hello, my name is Lynn Stanley and I serve as the Curator of Education at the Provincetown Art Association and Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Freddie Schifflevin Lecture with art critic, poet, and essayist John Yao for a talk on the artist Robert Motherwell in conjunction with the exhibition Robert Motherwell Beside the Sea on view in the museum's galleries through September 30th. This lecture series was begun in 2003 in honor of the artist Freddie Schifflevin, who was a member of Provincetown's arts community from the 1960s until her passing in 2002. Pam gratefully acknowledges John and Tony Levin, who make this program possible through their generous support. We'd also like to thank Angel Foods for their continued support and for another fabulous cheese platter. Please help yourselves to refreshments and visit Angel Foods located directly across the street. We hope you'll join us for the next Freddie Ship Levin Lecture on Tuesday, August 28th at 7 p.m. with Catherine Mosley, the master printmaker who collaborated with Motherwell from 1978 to 1991. And now, a bit of background on the exhibition and an introduction to John Yao. This year marks the 70th anniversary of Robert Motherwell's first visit to Provincetown and the 50th anniversary of the creation of his series Beside the Sea. The, the landmark exhibition, Robert Motherwell Beside the Sea, curated by Lise Motherwell and Dan Rinelli, is a celebration of these milestones. The exhibition features rare work created by the artist in his Provincetown studio during the summer of 1962 until his death in 1991. A collection of masterful paintings and collage, many inspired by the views from the artist's studio overlooking Provincetown's Bay and Tidal Flats. This is the first major exhibition of Motherwell's work on Cape Cod and provides a never before seen look at many pieces held in private collections. The poet, fiction writer, critic, and editor, John Yao, received his BA from Bard College and an MFA from Brooklyn College. He is the publisher of Black Square Editions, a small award-winning press which, was published, which has published poetry, fiction, criticism, and translations. In addition, he has published over 50 books of poetry, artist books, fiction, and art criticism, and has received numerous awards and grants, including a New York Foundation for the Arts Award, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, two Ingram Merrill Foundation Fellowships, and grants from the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation. His latest books include A Thing Among Things, The Art of Jasper Johns, published in 2008 by Distributed Arts Publishers, Egyptian Sonnets, published by Rain Taxi this year, and Further Adventures in Monochrome, published by Copper Canyon Press, also in 2012. From 2007 to 2011, he served as the arts editor for the Brooklyn Rail. He also created the online journal Hyperallergic Hyper Weekend, where he frequently posts his essays. If you haven't had the opportunity to read a beautiful and insightful essay John contributed to the Beside the Sea catalog, the book is on sale in the museum bookstore. Don't miss this opportunity to own a copy of this historic text. Along with John's prolific literary output, he finds time to teach in the Mason Gross School of the Arts at Rutgers University. We are thrilled he is able to join us to discuss Robert Motherwell's work today. Please help me welcome him. I know you're supposed to thank people, and I'd like to thank uh, the people who invited me uh, here, but also I would like to thank the mechanic because <laughs> yesterday at 7 we got off the highway and we noticed that our car had no brakes. And uh, we were in Milford when we did this, and uh, we passed a an auto mechanic that was open at 8.30 at night and drove in and they only fixed trucks and buses but then a man literally appeared named Stan and he worked on the car till midnight in the rain with no umbrella and then got up at 7, bought the rest of the parts and fixed our car and he said, I don't like to see people in trouble. It's very untypical, it seems to me, of most Americans. 
If you'd like a great mechanic, come up to me afterwards. And if you're ever in the Milford district and your car breaks down, I recommend Stan Hiley. He is an amazing person who, as I became more and more anxious, he got calmer and calmer. <laughs> All right, so I was trying to think of what to talk about, but Robert Motherwell, because I didn't want to just read my, read my essay. It's always the sneaky way to get out of things. So I thought I would talk a little bit about his relationship to poetry and poets, partly because, or mostly, or because I'm a poet myself, and I came to Motherwell's work. I can remember seeing it when I was 15 and grew up in Boston and saw it in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Anyway, I want to talk about his relationship to poetry, and particularly symbolism and surrealism, <coughs> which, if you think about it, is predicated on a way of reading that's sort of been challenged uh, by today's criticism, all right? Because today's criticism is, is more literal-minded, and it believes that, for instance, paint is just paint and that meaning has been driven out of painting to some degree. There is this kind of premise about that in New York. And Motherwell, I think, is the one abstract expressionist who actually directly responds to the challenge of minimalism and to the challenge presented by Stella when he says, what you see is what you see. And that the work will change around 62 up to 67 with Beside the Sea, Lyric Suite, and the Open series. And I feel like that aspect of Motherwell's not really been discussed fully enough. And I actually think that it comes out of his own uh, understanding of philosophy and poetry. All right, so in addition, I mean, just to kind of a little background of Motherwell, in addition to making works that referred to poets and poetry, such as Mallory Swan in 1942, Motherwell is the editor of the important anthology Data Poets and Painters, which exerted a profound influence on a generation of poets who emerged in New York in the early 60s, the so-called second generation of the New York School of Poets, including Ron Padgett, Ted Berrigan, Dick Gallup, and Joe Chiravolo. I remember when I got to New York and I met uh, Padgett and Berrigan, among the first things we talked about was whether I own the book data poets and poet painters. And like if I didn't, there was something wrong with me. <laughs> so instantly, I don't remember if I did own it and lied or I, whatever, but I owned it as they say. <laughs> and then uh, the, the, the other book that was really important, particularly for my generation would be the New American Poetry the New American Poetry, 1945-1965, that came out that was edited by Don Allen. And this anthology included poems by Frank O'Hara, who curated Motherwell's last uh, retrospective at MoMA in 1965. And uh, I don't know if any of you have ever read the criticism of that uh, uh, retrospective, but by 1965, a lot of the New York art world was uh, preoccupied with Andy Warhol and with minimalism. So that retrospective was actually got quite a lot of negative criticism, which I didn't really know till I started reading what was being written about it and completely surprised by it. Um, but the other poet that was in that anthology was uh, Robert Duncan, a poet who taught at Black Mountain College. And uh, the reason I mentioned Duncan is because there's an intersection between Duncan and Motherwell, which is hardly ever discussed, and that's the painter Cy Twombly. All right, so Duncan is at Black Mountain College and teaches, is teaching there when Twombly's a student. At some point, Twombly also encounters Robert Motherwell. Dunk, uh, Twombly does the first kind of illustration for a Duncan broadside published in Black Mountain called Song of the Border Guard. Now, beyond this historical fact of these three people intersecting, the one thing they seem to have in common is a love of symbols and the symbolic language. Two, the other thing they seem to have in common, unlike any other of the abstract expressionists, 
particularly, uh, Motherwell was interested in history. That's after all the elegy for the Spanish Republic. It must be seen in some regard as a history painting. And it's, it reminds us, if we don't really wish to remember it, that while the Germans and the fascists were defeated, they also triumphed in Spain. So in some sense, you could see why that elegy series could keep being made. It's not like the war was over just because the war was over, because there was a man named Franco around. Um, anyway, uh, Twombly has a strong love for the Mediterranean, moves to Italy, makes a lot of paintings based on history, on, on events, and also on literature. He bases a whole series of poems on John Keats, various other things, also on Egypt. Why well, I'm wearing my Egypt t-shirt. Um, so I just want to mention that because I feel like it's part of a mix that never gets discussed. Okay? So one of the things that um, Duncan said in a letter written to the poet Helen Adam is uh, this statement. It's this that I admire in the Surrealists, the powers of the word rather than the power of the word. I reach for that distinction. Okay, so Motherwell has a long and deep relationship to Surrealism. I think, I believe he first came to Provincetown that he was hoping to meet Mac, hang out with Max Ernst and Peggy Guggenheim, but Max being German, Americans being at World War II, German submarines, Max was not allowed to live on the coast. He had to move inland. Meanwhile, the Japanese had their own problems on the California, but we won't go there. Anyway, uh, and I believe he came with uh, Mata, but I'm not sure, but certainly Motherwell and Mata had a long relationship. So, what does that mean? He's interested in surrealism, he's interested in the possibility that a word, or I mean that a work could be, in could be uh, inspired by a dream, by an accident, by something unexpected, a rupture, that's something that would appeal to Motherwell and Duncan, that he would understand that language was not literal. I think this is really important because I think there is this kind of argument going on as to what meaning is. What is meaning? We argue over it all the time and everyone wants to, or many critics such as Clement Greenberg, wanted to propose a certain kind of reading. And Motherwell, I think, as much as he was kind of embroiled in all that, had to find his own way and actually stood against the notion of meaning being reductive and reading being reductive, that he stayed true to his symbolist roots. All right? So for that, he would understand that color and an image could stir up memories, it could stir up feelings, that paint was more than just paint. I think literally, as Stella says, I want my paintings to be good as the paint in the can. He kind of comes up with this literalist reading. All right. In this regard, Motherwell stays true to his symbolist roots. But at, in the 1960s, Stella says, what you see is what you see. And he challenges Motherwell. And it comes at a time when Motherwell's retrospective, particularly with the elegies for the Spanish Republic, get a bad press. They get a kind of negative reaction. And Motherwell, I don't think, was insensitive to it. I think he kind of figured out, all right, what do I do now? You know, who am I? What kind of paintings? And I think being in Provincetown really had a profound effect because he does Beside the Sea in 1962, and those are, those are on, on some basic level or nature abstractions. So he's opened himself up to something very simple and elemental, right? And he finds his way, as he says, by imitating the processes of nature. He makes a gesture that he says imitates the process of nature. He's not, as, as Stella would be saying, oh, this is what a painting is and I'm gonna find that, make a work that does that. He reduces the work to a gesture. And at the same time, I think, and this I think is really important, that both he and um, uh, Mark Rothko wanted to make what I'd call a naked painting, a painting kind of stripped down of its essentials. 
And that was very, very different than what I believe Stella meant when he wanted to strip a work down to its essentials. And I think that, that Motherwell's response can be seen as kind of a going against what the minimalist believed in. And I think this, and in a way, it's, it, it makes him, in a very real sense, contemporary, right? That he's, he understands that abstract expressionism is being seen as part of history. And he's saying, hey, wait a second, how can I be part of history? I'm still walking around breathing, right? This is like a ridiculous notion. So he, I think, directly takes on Stella and the Minimalists, beginning with Beside the Sea and actually upping the stakes in, um, when he does the open series. And I think, to my mind, the open series, um, well, I think it's actually, I don't know if this is heresy or not, but I think it's far greater than the elegies to the Spanish Republic. So if you wish to throw stones, you probably should start now. <laughs> and the reason I do is because compositionally, there's more chance. He does more. He moves that rectangle around, that open rectangle. He deals with space. He deals with atmosphere. He deals with light. He deals more with color. He gets more going on in those paintings and such things like this where he's influenced by the open series. And I think in a way it also opened him up literally to uh, a wider range of phenomena. So you can see that wonderful piece, the wild, the duck kind of emerging out of the water and the piece back there. And in a way, I want to read this. Uh, one of the things we think about abstract expressionism is this, it's always described as like macho and male. Have you ever heard that? kind of crazy. So here's what Barry Schwabsky said about the poet um, Stefan Mallarmé, and it made me think of Motherwell when he started doing the open series and uh, Beside the Sea and Lyric Suite. The language is spare and aerated. The lines seem to float across each other, creating contingent linkages from one to the next. An ally to the structural change is an emotional one. The poetry is overtaken by a profound tenderness. Now think about that. I mean, because the elegies to the Spanish Republic are all about tragedy, right? And in a way, if you look at these paintings, they're not about tragedy, or they're not about tragedy in that kind of dramatic way that the elegies were. And I must admit, at 16, I loved the elegies. What 16-year-old kid wouldn't love the elegies? They're tragic, they're in black and white, and they're about something awful. I was like smitten, <laughs> smitten, okay? I mean. There, you know, there's certain works that speak to you when you're at a certain age, like Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. I was smitten. I'll never be like that guy, right? I won't wear my trousers rolled. You'll notice they roll. <laughs> so I think, but I think really Motherwell changed. I think, I mean, and we, we don't, he gets seen in a certain way and then somehow we can't change how we look at, at certain artists. They're fixed. And I think we have to kind of learn to change how we look at artists. I think we have to keep our minds open and our eyes open because I think artists often the, the best keep changing. And we, we're too dumb to change. Like, oh, I'll just stay here. <laughs> All right? So. The poetry is overtaken by a profound tenderness. The poem does not defend, but rather opens itself. And I think literally Motherwell in Beside the Sea and Lyric Suite in the open series opens himself up. Opens himself up to trying to do more, have more possible readings of his work. He wasn't going to keep it into one thing. And because the poem does not defend itself, but rather opens itself up, even one might say submissively to the world, to nature, to the other, one does not feel the poet imposing his narrative on things, but on the contrary, seeking 
As the first line of one late poem has it, to insert myself into your plot. And I think really, if you think about Lyric Suite, he decides to do a thousand drawings. I mean, that was like so inspiring as a writer because writers, I mean, any writer, no matter how smart they are, figures they probably know nine things. So if they have to deal with doing a thousand, you're going to get beyond anything you know, right? <laughs> And he, and he actually does 565 in two months, right? And he only stops because his friend David Smith dies in a car accident. And it so kind of overwhelms him so much that he stops. And then he really feels like he can't start the series again later. But his goal was to do a thousand. I love the idea of setting yourself a goal. Do a thousand or something, do a hundred or something. My students, there's some of my writing students here, they know that I'm out. I only tell them to do 12 or something. <laughs> All right. This is the method I believe that we should still be trying to follow the method, to borrow a metaphor from another great poem, of letting the widowed stone of language divest itself fold by fold. And this is what I really wanted to kind of get to, that in reading Motherwell's work, I think we have to, I think this is true of all great artists, that there's no single way, or all great poets, you don't read John Ashby the same way you read Mary Oliver. If you can only read Mary Oliver and you think there's only one way to read poetry, you cannot read John Ashby. If you read John Ashby and think there's no other way to read poetry, you can't read Stanley Kunis, Mary Oliver, any other number of poets. Alan Dugan, you have to learn to read a poet. And I believe it's true that you have to learn to read artists, that artists demand that of you, that you take the time to learn how to read them, that you become sensitive to who they are without judgment, without preconceptions, and that it's, it's it requires a lot of faith, it requires a lot of time, it requires a lot, but it requires one thing more than anything else, right? It requires that you love art. If you love art, you're willing to spend time looking at art, looking at it, thinking about it, because it's like central to your life, right? You can't live without it. I mean, there's a thing on uh, the internet by Seth Abramson a hundred ways poetry is in your life. And I thought that was an interesting thing. I haven't read the list, but I'm scared to. <laughs> so anyway, that's, I think you have to think about Motherwell's work. And my sense is that, the, that really being in Provincetown changed him because in a way these are you know, nature abstractions. He couldn't have done them in New York. I think it changed. De Kooning, when De Kooning moved to Long Island, it made his work very different, softer in some way. The light in the work changed. I think that is important. And I think the other thing that's important, which uh, I hadn't thought about till my wife's a painter brought this up, so I have to give her credit, Eve Ashheim. The fact is, is abstract, these abstractions beside the sea come from the sea. And how important is the sea to the kind of history of American abstraction. You think of John Marin, right? You think of the sea, this kind of chaos being important. So there's John Marin, but then if you think of Jackson Pollock, one of his first breakthrough poems, paintings he titles Full Fathom Five, that suddenly the sea becomes this constantly changing reality that's never still, becomes a ground, a place of thinking about painting. And what does he make in these paintings with the, beside the sea? Maximum in, impact and complete dissolution. This kind of one gesture. And yet, you know, you can see it as existential, which a lot of people do. But I think of it as more influenced by his uh, love for Asian art and the kind of, you know, first thought, best thought, first gesture, best gesture that he's not, it's not existential in the way that one thinks of existential as being like fraught with worry, 
I don't think of these paintings as, as exhibiting or embodying that worry. I mean, he may have been worried before he made the painting, after he made the painting, but when he was making the painting, I don't think worry was like a big deal. Maybe I'm wrong. I think, I think worry gets overrated, you know? I really, I mean, I do because I, I always meet these people, oh, I can't write, oh, I don't have anything to write about. And it's like, they're not really gonna write. They're not really writers. They're just people who want to worry about writing. <laughs> it's important, you know? Or I can't paint, I don't know what to paint, I'm so, I don't have any ideas. It's like, what? How can you not have ideas? How can you not have something to paint? How can you not have something to write about? And I think Motherwell scares us because he does the open series and, and he never, as he says to his daughter, I think he never gets it right, so he keeps making paintings. And if you think, you know, and people will constantly say, oh, but he made 300 of them, you know, how many are any good? I don't really think it's about how many are any good. I mean, I think it's really about you have this thought and you keep going to it to see what you can get out of it and what you can do with it. And, it's the, and there are these people who are going to worry about what's good or not. Right? They're, and those people, I think, are also people who don't make a lot of work. Like, well, you know, if you make 300, they can't be all that good, so I'll make two. You know? <laughs> okay, fine. You know, I, I don't believe in that kind of uh, uh, self-serving kind of anxiety. I think artists are like, like all people, we worry every day. How can you not get up and not be worried? I mean, God. Worry is like commonplace. It's the people who don't worry that I want to go. You know, that Zen Buddhist minister, I do, I do want to study with him in the end. He seems not to be worried, but... The other thing I think uh, uh, I want to say about these, uh, these works is that, in a way, I think Motherwell in the open series uh, tried to, uh, tried, I mean, he wanted to stay open to this idea that everything could end up inside a book, Every, the wor everything exists in the world could end up in a book, you know, the great Stefan Mallarmé belief. And I think in a, some way, with his collages, with, with his work, he wanted to believe that everything could end up inside a work of art. That he has, you know, with his collage, it's just like the stuff that comes to him, stuff that he cares about, he puts it in his work, then there's the paintings, what could I do with this kind of basic structure? But the basic structure is, is so, I mean, it's so obvious, it's a window within, you know, a painting is a window and it's a surface. I mean, that's sort of preoccupied people since the early Renaissance, and in, what's inside and what's outside. And I think Motherwell didn't believe those questions ever left. And I think if you think of people, uh, a contemporary, I mean, he's dead, but a painter like Ralph Humphrey, you can think that he was preoccupied with that after Motherwell, that, you know, what is a painting? And I think in that sense, he, he understands that the questions never go away, that you don't come up with an answer, that the difference between him and Stahl was Stahl came up with what he thought was the answer. And, and Motherwell recognized that the question doesn't leave us. How, and that you can't ever solve the question. You can only come to the question each time with another possible answer. But you don't solve it. And I think that's what keeps his paintings fresh um, throughout his life. So I'll stop here and let you guys ask me questions, none of which I'll know how to answer. <laughs> so. Also, I mean, just elementally, I mean, just, I thought, I mean, his colors are elemental, like the ochre, the blue, right? That he really gets everything down into this thing, but it's not, you don't feel like it's reductive. He always is able to do something more with it that kind of is striking, right? And uh, I mean, I think that side of him uh, should be talked about more, that, you know, that elemental side is actually quite powerful. I don't think you have to go to Italy to understand that. You just come to Provincetown.
No questions? Come on, Richard Baker doesn't have any questions for me? I don't believe that. Yes? Did you ever meet him? I did. I met him twice uh, or three times. I knew his daughter, Jeannie, and I went to Bard College. So I knew her, and then I met him probably when I was 19. I, I remember a oh, deeply embarrassing moment. Where it, I was invited to Jeannie's wedding, and I was standing with Motherwell in his studio, and there was a print of uh, Jasper Johns's Targets on the studio wall. I said, it must be really nice to make art around the, while well, there's art by great artists around you. <laughs> and, and I didn't mean that negatively, but it could be taken the wrong way. And I saw, you know how you see the words leave? <laughs> I saw, I saw them leave, and I saw them printed out there, and I went, oh, geez, that was stupid. And, I, and the rest of the time, I, I didn't say anything. Really. I just was, so, I felt so dumb. But you know, it was one of those, to me, I mean, he was someone that I had seen when I was 15, and I just had this great admiration for. I saw his collage show, that was it? The Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. I still have the catalog 30 years later, right? And I, I read everything I could about him. He was an intellectual. I, I was really attracted to that. You know, I, didn't, I, I was attracted to the, to the subject matter. So when I met him, I, I literally didn't know what to say. So I just burbled out something dumb. I think people do that all the time. I met my publisher, I met Rosemary Waldrop, this great poet, publisher, and I introduced her to my girlfriend by saying to my girl, saying, this is my girlfriend, Rosemary Waldrop. <laughs> Freud would have had a field day with that. <laughs> right? I was like, and my girlfriend just punched me. <laughs> so that was the beginning of the end of that relationship, I guess. Anyway. Any other questions? I keep going. Go ahead. Uh, did he write poetry? No. Or if he did, it's a secret. I think everybody writes poetry. And then there's some of the people are smart enough to not publish it, and other people are <laughs> dumb enough to publish it. I think, I mean, because, you know, Jasper Johns actually did write poetry. But his comment to me was, doesn't everybody? So he may have written, he did study philosophy, he did, I think, he probably wrote, he wrote quite well, I think, when he wrote, so I think he probably did, but I think he probably hid them. Do you know his educational background? Yeah, he went to Stan, he went to private school in California, and then he went to Stanford instead of Berkeley, because Stanford had smaller departments. He had gotten A's in the school he went to, and then he went to Harvard. He studied philosophy, I believe, uh, in Stanford and also at Harvard. And he talks about that Russell, Bertrand Russell and Wittgenstein were the kind of, there was a sort of mathematical logic was the kind of uh, philosophy being taught when he went to school. He also studied with Albert Girard, a great teacher of French literature who's, uh, I think, written a number of books that I remember certainly as a kid buying uh, that were really important as introductions to French literature. So he studied with pretty important figures, I think, who, who brought a certain, you know, quite a lot of knowledge to the, to the table. And um, I, he says that he became an abstract artist because he had studied philosophy and he didn't need to go through a kind of figurative period because he understood that structures had relationships to each other and that there was a kind of relation, you know, that he believed that and so that he didn't uh, kind of suffer through the way, say, Gorky or any number of other artists suffered through trying to move into abstraction from figuration. Um, I remember as a kid being kind of wowed by the fact that he got to abstraction in a certain way of working so fast. You know, I, re I remember that 
Yeah, being really struck by that, you know. And I think if you go to the Clifford Still Museum, you'll see he still went through a whole lot of stuff before he became Clifford Still, and then he kind of hit it, but now it's all going to be public. Well, do you know if he went to any kind of art hmm? classes or art school or anything? I feel like I, I'm interviewing you. <laughs> you are, but that's okay. Um, no, I don't think he did. I think he studied, I mean, he went to Mexico with Mata. He kind of did these drawing things. He studied with Maya Shapiro, who kind of, kind of encouraged him to pursue art, but I don't think he studied it. Uh, there are a lot of artists who, I mean, it's, it's, you can't, like Joseph Cornell never went to art school. I mean, there's certain artists that don't go to art school, and some do, and I think you can't generalize on either side of the coin about that. I think it's what, or what did Melville say, you know, I, I tried to undo my education, right? I mean, I think it's whatever your education is, you either undo it or you get it, right? And I think my feeling is that artists who are self-taught uh, in some way stay students their whole life. And then because they feel like they never can acquire the, the, the paradigm or the model, right? As a student, you believe you can get the model. Like, now I'm, a, now I'm a good student, now I can go make my art. And I think in that way, it keeps you open to some degree. But that's a generalization, so I take it back. <laughs> yes? Yes, he was. And are there ways that you might see that in his work? As someone who's been to an analyst for 22 years and not been cured, <laughs> no. <laughs> and the reason I say that is I think that you kind of can use that kind of Freudian model that was applied, say, to reading his. Uh, uh, elegies to the Spanish Republic in a way that I think diminishes the paintings or gets too reductive. So I, I think uh, I, I kind of avoid Freudian analysis when it comes to writing about stuff or looking at art. A, because I'm not that smart. B, I'm not that subtle. I think someone who really s knows that could be really subtle about it. But otherwise, I think it tends to be too flat-footed and ham-fisted and reductive. So, no. It's not to say it's not there. It's just to say I don't, I don't want to touch that with a 10-foot mall brush. <laughs> Any other questions? Richard, you haven't asked me a question yet. What's wrong with you? I'm going to talk to you later about this. <laughs> what? OK. Yes? So, when I'm a dosing and gallery guarding, people ask me about the giant painting that's behind you. But I haven't found anything in the catalog about it, so if you could. Oh, what's the title of this one? Well, you can see it as Cape Cod right there, right? <laughs> it says Provincetown Bay. <laughs> I mean, I think that he was willing to accept those accidents in his work. Do you know what I mean? That you see a, a similarity between a gesture, a mark you make, and you just don't deny it. You don't run from it, right? There's this uh, the writer Ronald Sukunik. Um, he and I were having a conversation. He said, "The moment that you're embarrassed and you keep writing is the moment you become a writer." And I've ne I was like 20 years old, and I was like, and it's, that's stuck in my head, right? And it's like, and you know, it, I told the painter once, I won't, whose name, I, I said, oh, I see fish in your paintings. You're never supposed to say to an abstract artist, I see. <laughs> and she had given me the painting, and she took it back. <laughs> And then years later, I, saw, I went to another poet critic's house, and that painting was there. And I had my moment. I could have said, 
hey, you know, I see fish in those pins. <laughs> and I decided, no, I'll just let it go. <laughs> so, I mean, I think there's that side to it, and I think also the color, if you think of the color, it's really, it's about a beach, right? I mean, it raises up sand and stuff. And then, once you say that, it's like, what kind of meaning do you want to get out of it? You know, like, like what do we want from a painting? Because we go to, like, my, my, what, what, I mean, I think we have to ask ourselves, what do we want from a poem? What do we want from a painting? And what can it give us? And I think it's different. And I think maybe it's just the pleasure of looking at something where you see it and then it disappears and you go, no, it's not that. It can't be that simple. And it leaves you. And then you're left with some other kind of looking. So tell the people that. Watch them run out of this museum. <laughs> screaming. <laughs> yes? So what, what is uh, interesting is that when I, I was listening to you and just, you know, like everybody else, looking at that painting for a long time, and I'm thinking, you know, Papias, I mean, for me, you know, this is clear uh, about Spain, and the color, the brown, that brown, that dirt, the sienna color. Listen to her, see that? She got from Provincetown to Spain. <laughs> yeah, that's there. And he loved Tapias. He had, Tapias had a lot of mutual high respect for each other. They both wrote in their paintings, among other things. He recently died, Mr. Tapias. He's a great artist. Come on, more questions. It's fun. I can just say things. Yes? Well, obviously, he and O'Hare knew each other and were friends. I think O'Hare was probably difficult for Motherwell. And I think uh, because O'Hare just being a kind of, but O'Hare also being a kind of amazing person and high energy, that I think Motherwell's like, ah. Um, I, think he, I think he basically liked classical you know, poets more than um, anybody else. He liked Eliot. Uh, he probably liked Pound less than Eliot, and I probably liked Pound more than Eliot. Um, and O'Hare, and he probably, knew, you know, knew the work of the, he obviously knew the work of the Dada poets that were in the book. Um, he and I didn't, I mean, we talked once briefly about poetry, but I, I just kind of felt too dumb to ask him about it. You know what I mean? Like, who do you read? You know, I didn't, you should really be able to go up to someone and say, who do you read? Right? You should. But the minute you say it, you feel like, that's just the dumbest thing. <laughs> you know, like, you should be able to go up to Francis Ford Coppola and say, hey, what are your favorite movies? <laughs> Who do you think's a really great director? You should. And they should be able to like not get defensive and hide behind something and say, oh, I really like the Ch uh, Charlie Chaplin or you know, something unexpected. But I think we, we train ourselves to give like the certain kind of right answer. And I think Motherwell probably was of that generation where he was a little defensive. So I don't think I actually had the conversation I should have had with him, to be honest. And I didn't get to know him well enough. Someone like Jack Flam probably could have told you better. You're not, what, what's the rest of the interview? Oh, yes, well, the last question is, um, he died 21 years ago, so what happened to all of his work after he died? Well, the, usually when you die, there's an estate, right? <laughs> an estate. In his case, was he prepared for this before he died, and he started what was the Daedalus Foundation. The Daedalus Foundation, yeah, all the work that was in his possession went to the Daedalus Foundation, along with, uh, I believe, all the books in his library. Actually, if you want to know what poetry he read, you should go to the Daedalus Foundation. You can ask them. His entire library is there, and it's pretty stunning. I remember sitting there. Uh, and thinking of what art books I would like to steal because they were quite, quite impressive. I love, I mean, artists, they're like, Kitai, for instance, had the greatest 
uh, Degas library that you could probably find. And it made sense if you know Kitai's work. So he had a huge number of Picasso books and Matisse books. And I kind of remember sitting and I was sitting in the table where I was just looking at the Matisse and Picasso going, I have that one. I don't have that one. I don't have that one. I don't have that one. Oh my God, I don't have that one. Freaking out. And if Richard Baker would have been with me, we would have put them all in shopping bags and run out the door. <laughs> and then he would have done paintings of them and returned them. And I would not have. What? When you go to the library again, I'll go with them. Oh, okay. <laughs> Probably in October we can go. It's a great library. Um, so anyway, there's an estate, and his estate was to, it gives away money for various projects that you can apply for, and the artist to go to museums and certain collections. And Jack Flam, who was actually my teacher at Brooklyn College in art history, um, is doing the catalog raisonné. And that seems fairly uh, standard for an artist to, who, who's known. How does he or she preserve the body of work after they die, right? Because that is something to think about. And I think in his case, he was well known and he did make plans for how it would be taken care of. But also with the awareness that the money that would be made from the sales of his work should among other things go back into the art world. You can see that with the Krasner Pollock. You can see that with certain artists. And I think it's kind of wonderful. You know. Uh, is that it? Thank you. Oh, one more. Wait, yes. This painting. Yes. The cover book. I read in there because I understood it that he made that by just putting his paintbrush and slamming it on. The yeah, that's uh, that's. I mean, think about that. He just he he did. He so he loaded the brush and he made a gesture. And he comes up with that. It's kind of beautiful in lyrics. So you have, as much as it's about no control, it's about a lot of control, yeah. right? You know, and I think that's, I mean, there's a really, you know, he was briefly, or not briefly, he was married to the artist Helen Frankenthaler, and I wrote about Helen Frankenthaler's relationship to Asian art. And, every, and a number of critics, one for the Wall Street Journal, said it was a fantasy because I was a Chinese-American poet. I mean, as, as close to being racist as you could get without jumping off the bridge and into the... <laughs> and uh, I, I pointed, and, and they said that she, she didn't know, she didn't care about Asian art, and I, and E.A. Carmine, who actually did a Motherwell retrospective, the, the collage one said that he, she never mentioned Asian art in her entire life in the 30 years she, he knew Helen Frankenthaler. And the letter I should have written, but I didn't, was, well, you have never been to her house because it's full of Asian art, right? It's, it had Japanese screens, it had woodcuts, it had a beautiful this and that. Motherwell was also interested in Asian art and read a lot about it, read a lot about calligraphy, and I think actually probably influenced Helen Frankenthaler to rethink her relationship to that. So I think in a way, it's about a kind of Western understanding of what a Zen master would do, making a single gesture, right? Which is kind of great because it's not like a bad imitation of Asian art, you know what I mean? It's its its, its own thing, which is kind of great. You know? Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>